This episode is sponsored by Squarespace. On April 20th of 2023, SpaceX carried out the first integrated flight test of the Starship and Super Heavy booster. After years of waiting, Starship addicts around the world were tuned in to watch one of the most anticipated inaugural flights in the modern spaceflight era. And just after 8.33 in the morning, Starship officially became the most powerful rocket ever produced. This was an incredible event to witness firsthand, and the sound generated by the Super Heavy Booster's 33 Raptor engines is something I will never forget. This test flight was a huge success for SpaceX, even though the vehicle was destroyed before it could reach the point of stage separation. It's been just over two weeks since the launch, and by now, most of you have already heard the details about what occurred during the aftermath of this event. In particular, there has been an unprecedented amount of attention directed towards the destruction of the blast surface under the orbital launch mount. As a result, SpaceX has received a lot of criticism for not implementing a traditional flame trench into the original design of the orbital launch mount. While it's true that a flame trench could have been a guaranteed method for preventing something like this from happening, that doesn't mean it's the only solution that will work. For the past five months, SpaceX has been developing a massive, first-of-its-kind, water-cooled steel blast surface which they planned to install after the first launch. Instead of delaying this test flight until the system was ready, SpaceX made a calculated decision to beef up the pad using a highly specialized form of concrete which should have been able to survive for at least a single launch. Unfortunately, this did not work out as planned, and instead of eroding away the top layer of the blast surface, the Super Heavy booster appeared to punch straight through it as if it wasn't even there. So how did this happen? Did SpaceX vastly overestimate the strength of this concrete, or is there something that we are missing? After completing our analysis, we have concluded that this idea may have been destined to fail from the start, but not for the reasons that most of you are probably thinking. In my opinion, there was a small but critical design flaw that may have been overlooked, and if not for this one thing, the results would have been considerably different. My name is Zach Golden, and welcome to another CSI Starbase Deep Dive Investigation. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. Before we get started with today's deep dive investigation, I wanted to take a second to express my appreciation for the level of effort that the SpaceX team put into their launch day coverage. The overall quality of production was amazing, and the amount of unique camera angles from the drones and pad cameras was exactly what all of us Starship fans were hoping for. Beyond that, the commentators did a fantastic job educating people about the history of the Starship program and explaining all of SpaceX's short and long-term goals for this vehicle. So thank you to SpaceX for putting on such a great show. Even though this was repeatedly mentioned during the live stream event, I think it's important to reiterate the fact that the main goal of this integrated flight test was to get the Starship clear of the pad. This means that no matter what happened after this moment, whether the pad was partially destroyed or the ship failed to reach orbit, it would still be viewed as a success in the eyes of SpaceX. For this reason, anyone who labels the results as a failure is simply writing their own narrative. From the viewpoint of SpaceX, a failure of this mission would have resulted in a total annihilation of the launch complex. As you all know, that did not occur, so even though there was significant damage to the pad, the overall mission was still accomplished. It will take numerous attempts for SpaceX to achieve rapid reusability with the Starship, and until they do, we should not expect the launch system to be 100% rapidly reusable either. But with that being said, over the past seven or eight months, SpaceX engineers have been working diligently to design protective measures that have drastically increased the robustness of Stage Zero. From what I can tell, these new upgrades that haven't really gotten much attention have performed extremely well. So, after we explain everything that went wrong and what SpaceX will need to change going forward, we will spend the second half of this episode analyzing what went right. There are a lot of things that we should be celebrating here instead of criticizing when we discuss this engineering marvel. As we go through this, I'm going to be as thorough as possible, 
which means some of this will be things you have already heard, but the majority of it will be all new information. This episode has been in the making for nearly seven months, and we have a lot of exclusive animations from Ryan Hansen Space, which will help us along the way. With that public service announcement out of the way, let's get into this deep dive investigation. This is a rather large one because it's something that I predicted would not happen and ended up being dead wrong about. What I'm talking about here is the Raptor Chill collection system for the Super Heavy Booster, which as you may have noticed, we're still connected to the Raptor engines. For those who don't know what I'm talking about here, I'm referring to these frosted pipes at the bottom of the launch ring. I was wondering if the commentators would mention this considering they have discussed the chill down sequence on previous suborbital flight tests for Starship, but unfortunately they didn't. This was a change that was made after the Booster 7 anomaly that occurred during spin prime testing on July 11th of 2022. Long story short, SpaceX decided that they no longer wanted to dump liquid oxygen from the Raptor engine pre-chill process underneath the vehicle. In order to prevent high energy detonations from occurring during the engine spin-up and ignition sequence, SpaceX decided they needed to remove as much oxygen as possible from this danger zone. So instead of venting the liquid gas mixture underneath the vehicle, they began diverting it away from the launch mount. The solution they settled on was to connect stainless steel flex hoses to all 33 Raptor engines. On the opposite end, the hoses are connected to pipes that were secured to the inside edge of the launch mount skirt. From there, the 33 pipes are connected to a circular collection manifold, and then the liquid oxygen is routed to a retention pond located adjacent to the integration tower. It was pretty amazing being able to see video footage of the collection pond from the aerial perspective. Raptor chill down began right around the 20 minute mark in the countdown, which was interesting because during most static fire tests, we have seen Raptor chill commence immediately after propellant loading begins. Anyways, as I mentioned in my deep dive investigation on this topic, I didn't expect to see this occur during the first integrated flight test. Up until the 31 engine static fire test, I believed that the flex hoses were routed through the side of the opening created by the missing engine shielding. I couldn't think of any other explanations for why they would wait so long to replace the damaged shielding. Because of this, I also assumed that there would be no way SpaceX would launch this vehicle with 33 flex hoses coming in through the side of the engine skirt. But when Booster 7 was rolled out to the launch complex for the final time, we noticed these fittings on the bottom of the engine skirt. This was my first time seeing them up close, which is when I realized that these were connection ports for the flex hoses. Initially, they just looked like huge bolts to attach the shielding plates, which is slightly embarrassing that the correct answer was right there in front of us this whole time. These 33 flex hoses remained attached until T plus five seconds. As the booster slowly lifted itself off of the hold down arms, each of these hoses were ripped free and then partially obliterated by the outer 20 Raptor engines. As you can imagine, this also caused all of the stainless steel pipes to be destroyed. While walking through the debris field a few days later, I actually came across one of these flex hoses out in the wetland area. This is something that I believe we will see changed in the near future. The permanent solution will likely be incorporated into the Raptor QD. This would remove the need for replacing all of this damaged pipework after every launch. As of now, we have already seen the first signs that this will actually occur. On April 29th, nine days after the launch, Starship Gazer caught these incredibly well-timed images of all of the flex hoses being removed from the inside of the launch ring. The next day, he also captured these images, showing a pallet full of Raptor QDs laying on the ground near the orbital launch mount. So it looks like SpaceX has wasted very little time getting to work on this upgrade process. We can't say for sure whether or not this change will include Raptor chill collection, or if these are simply being removed for inspection purposes. But we will have our answer pretty much immediately when Booster 9 rolls out with all of its engines installed. If we don't see these ports on the bottom of B9 skirt, we can probably assume that the Raptor chill system has been redesigned to support rapid reusability. While we're on the topic of upgrades, are you ready to take your business to the next level? If so, then it's time for you to join thousands of entrepreneurs who have transformed their businesses with the help of Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform that offers an amazing website builder with customizable templates and cutting-edge marketing tools to help you revolutionize your online presence. One of the standout features of Squarespace is its user-friendly interface. Designed for those without prior coding or website design experience, this platform's intuitive drag-and-drop editor makes building and updating your website quick and easy. Matter of fact, you can probably have it done before SpaceX finishes their excavation work under the orbital launch mount. All Squarespace templates are fully responsive, ensuring that your website displays optimally across various devices, including laptops, tablets, and mobile phones. 
it really doesn't get much easier than this. So don't procrastinate. Head over to squarespace.com slash CSI Starbase and save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. You can find the link to that in the description below. Moving on to the next milestone in the countdown, at T minus 11 minutes, John Innsbrucker announced that the hold down clamps used to secure the booster in place had been unlatched. Also configuring the launch pad for liftoff. The booster hold downs have been unlatched. They'll be ready to retract at liftoff. This was pretty shocking to learn that the hold down clamps are released this early into the countdown sequence, but it makes sense to do this for many reasons. The first reason is because at this point in the countdown, there is upwards of 4,000 tons of propellant in the first and second stage vehicles. I'm not sure how much wind speed would be required to tip over the Starship when it's fully loaded with propellant, but it's probably safe to say that we would be talking about hurricane force winds. This makes it even more important to monitor the load on the hold down arms as engines are igniting. This is something I discussed in my most recent deep dive investigation, which you can view here if you haven't already. In that episode, I mentioned the possibility of multiple engines failing to ignite during a launch and the need to be able to safely balance the load in order to ensure that the booster doesn't shift to the side and collide with the hold down arms or the side of the orbital launch mount. Well, lo and behold, that's exactly what occurred. Booster 7 ended up losing three engines immediately at startup. It didn't collide with anything on the launch mount, but it did perform a pretty serious power slide as predicted. We will touch on this again later in the investigation. Before we discuss what occurred at the moment of liftoff, I want to give a brief mention about the detonation suppression system. The detonation suppression system uses water and high pressure gaseous nitrogen to disperse oxygen from underneath the engines. By doing this, SpaceX is able to further reduce the possibility of a detonation occurring under the vehicle during engine startup. This system was activated at T minus 15 seconds, and from there, it had less than 30 seconds to live. Once the booster throttled up and destroyed the pad, this system became one of the first casualties. Looking at images taken two days after the event, we can see that the nitrogen downpipes that connect to the circular manifold in the middle of the table were completely destroyed. This is not designed to be a single-use system like the Raptor Chill Collection, so this is definitely an undesirable outcome. Luckily, it shouldn't be a huge deal to replace them, and during future launches, I expect that this may have a better chance of surviving. Miraculously, the circular nitrogen manifold in the center of the table managed to survive the punishment. This was the one component that I was actually convinced would sustain some pretty serious damage, but I'm glad I was wrong about that as well. Beyond this, there was some slight damage to the fire extinguisher system as one of the pipes that are used to supply the spiral nozzles in the center of the table was damaged. This isn't a huge deal either though because ideally this system will never actually be used anyways. All right, next up is the moment of ignition which occurred at T minus two seconds. It took seven seconds to ignite all 33 engines and throttle up before Starship lifted off the pad for the first time ever. It's truly incredible the amount of force being generated by the super heavy booster. And the crazy part is this was still 1.5 million pounds of thrust away from being max power. Looking at this amazing footage from the everyday astronaut and cosmic perspective, you can see massive shockwaves traveling up the vehicle. There's no way to know for certain but if there was one moment during this launch that would have resulted in the loss of thermal protection tiles on Ship 24, it was probably this one. Now, this is just my opinion, but I think that if the ship was hit with flying debris from the concrete tornado, then we would see more than just a few isolated tiles here and there being damaged or torn free. SpaceX took a lot of care over the past several months to make sure that all of these tiles were properly seated so that they wouldn't be shaken free as the shockwaves are traveling up the body of the vehicle. Overall, I think the TPS tiles performed much better than a lot of folks expected, as far as we can tell. Although it is likely that losing this small number of tiles would still have resulted in the destruction of the vehicle during the re-entry phase. Unfortunately, Ship 24 didn't make it that far, so we weren't able to see how the ship would hold up under those conditions. The addition of a water deluge system in the future may significantly reduce the severity of the shock waves by absorbing a lot of the acoustic energy produced by the 33 Raptor engines. One would think that this would become even more important once Starship moves on to missions where it's actually carrying a payload. I should note, however, that we are no longer certain that SpaceX is actually intending to install a real water deluge system, but we will get to that here in a bit. Next up, liftoff. As I mentioned, ignition occurred at T minus two seconds. 
It took four seconds to ignite the 33 engines and one second into throttle up at T plus three seconds, we witnessed the first large slab of concrete ejected from the blast surface at the base of the launch mount. This is a bit of a guess on the time because it didn't become visible until T plus five seconds. However, based on the speed it was traveling, I estimated that it occurred roughly two seconds before. It's important to note which side fractured and gave way first because it explains why there was significantly more damage in this area. Essentially, if we are looking to identify the point of failure in this situation, the best place to look is around the area with the most damage. The western and northern sides of the blast surface were the next to be blown out as the booster continued to increase its throttle. You can actually see the moment where the violent exhaust flow punches through the blast surface and comes in contact with the earth underneath the pad. It happens shortly after the large chunks of debris are ejected in this location. Notice the dark cloud that erupts from beneath the table shortly after T plus six seconds. Following this, the concrete next to the launch mount in the same direction was ripped free as if someone took a giant spatula and tossed the slabs of concrete into the orbital tank farm like it was Sunday morning pancakes. A large chunk of concrete landed on the compressed gas cylinders, and thankfully this didn't cause a secondary explosion since some of these cylinders just to the left of these are storing compressed methane at 200 bar or close to 3000 PSI. If these were punctured, it could have ended really badly. But they weren't, so let's move on. Three seconds later at T plus nine, there is another dark plume that appears on the backside of the launch mount. This is the explosion that sent all of the debris that destroyed the press cameras that were located on the landing pad and across the street at the employee parking lot. All right, now let's take a look at the aftermath and see if we can get a better understanding of why this happened. In the center of what used to be the blast surface, you can see the exposed auger pilings that have been partially destroyed. I think this is a very important detail, but in order to explain why that is, we need to quickly get a better understanding of how the foundation of this launch mount was constructed. The first step in forming the base structure of the orbital launch mount was to place six massive auger pilings roughly 30 meters deep into the ground. In this image, you can see the large holes which had already been completed. Laying nearby are two of the 90 foot long rebar cages waiting to be used in the remaining piles. These auger piles are extremely important because they are used to anchor the structure into the ground. Once all six pilings were completed, the hexagonal base structure was formed and then the rebar cages were placed inside and also filled with concrete. These are the same strands of rebar that were left exposed after this side of the base structure was blown out. Now, this is the important part. In the center of the pad, there were 24 smaller piles drilled to an unknown depth into the ground. These are used to support the blast surface in the center of the pad. One thing to note here is that each of these piles were reinforced using a single strand of rebar instead of a full cage with a circular grouping of rods coming out of the top. I think this is pretty odd because it makes it so that these are nowhere near as strong as they could be. Our field agents were unable to find many examples of this as we were researching this topic. But from my understanding, this type of piling could be significantly more vulnerable to cracks that can form as a result of shear stresses being exerted on the column. I will explain why that is important here in a second. The following flyover showed a few layers of rebar laid in the center of the hexagon. It doesn't look very thick, at least not as thick as it should be considering that this pad has to tie in with the pilings without leaving several feet of dirt in between. So I believe there was already a larger base layer of concrete present at this time under that rebar. It's hard to tell from this image, but there will be more evidence of this as we go. After this, the secondary layer of concrete was filled in. Fast forwarding two years, on November 14th of 2022, Booster 7 performed a 14 engine static fire test, which caused a significant amount of erosion on the top layer of the blast surface. Looking back at this, the raining debris truly was minuscule in terms of the size of pebbles that were blasted away from the pad. This left several craters in the blast surface directly beneath the engines. SpaceX replaced the top layer with an unknown material that was likely similar to the martite used underneath the two suborbital pads. This had to be replaced yet again after the 11 engine test on November 29th. In my opinion, this was one of the most violent looking static fires that we saw on the orbital launch mount, even beating out the 33 engine test. Following this test, SpaceX upgraded the blast surface for a second time, now using a higher strength material known as Fondag RS. As Elon mentioned during his recent Twitter space discussion, Fondag is literally the strongest form of concrete in the world. This time around, we were able to see the formwork that was laid down before the Fondag was placed on top. Looking from the aerial view, once again, you can see that there does appear to be a base layer of concrete underneath the rebar. As far as we can tell, 
this was never replaced. One thing I haven't figured out is how the top layer was removed without damaging the base layer underneath. I'm not saying this is what happened, but I do think we should consider the possibility that the jackhammers used to remove the top layer could potentially have caused micro cracks to form in the base layer, which, if true, would be a very bad thing. So after the top layer was replaced with Fondag, B7 performed a 31 engine static fire test and everything seemed to work out pretty well, at least on the surface. But if those cracks were present in the base layer, then they could have easily been made worse during the 31 engine test. Even though the thrust was only at 47% during the static fire, that is still a significant amount of force. Let's take another look at the arrangement of 24 auger piles in the center of the hexagonal base structure. This time, let's focus on the areas where the pilings are not present. You can see that in these four corners, there are no piles present at all. The other two corners do have these supports, but for some reason, there are none in these locations. Now, this might not sound like a huge deal if you assume that the only place where the piles are needed is directly under the engines. I mean, just using common sense, this is obviously where we should expect the force being exerted by the engines to be the greatest. While this is true, it doesn't mean that outside of the circle, there's not going to be any forces pushing down on the blast surface. That's just not how gases work. According to our estimations, and keep in mind these numbers may not be exact, the stagnation pressure directly beneath the Raptor should be around 16 bar, which is equivalent to just over 160 tons per square meter. The gaps between the individual plumes will probably be about the same as well, so it's fair to say that we can expect to see 16 bar pressure across the blast surface directly underneath the booster. Outside of the hexagonal ring, which is also past the perimeter of the six columns, the pressure will be just above ambient, so about one bar. In between those two areas, there will be a pressure gradient as the supersonic exhaust gases are transitioning to a subsonic flow. Keep in mind that the exhaust gases started off traveling at a speed of around Mach 3 as they exit the main combustion chamber. This means that the blast surface immediately outside of the radius of the 24 auger piles will still be experiencing around 15 bar of pressure or 150 tons per square meter. The heavily reinforced concrete tension band between the legs could be experiencing around 10 bar or 100 tons per square meter. Maybe it's less, maybe it's more, but hopefully you can see my point here. So with that being said, I think that the area that would be most at risk of failing would be these four zones right here. Essentially, these four corners are, or were, under supported. Now this obviously wasn't a problem during the 31 engine test because there was about half the amount of force being exerted on the pad. But when the booster throttled up to full thrust, I think it's highly probable that this corner began to buckle and then the piling closest to the corner decided that this is not what it signed up for and failed due to excessive shear stress. Immediately after that, the base layer of concrete was fractured and broke free from the rest of the blast surface. This opened up a crack in the base layer, which gave the exhaust plume direct access to the sand layer underneath. Depending on how much water was present under here, this could have produced a rather large steam explosion as well. After this, the corner that broke free was the first thing ejected from under the OLM, and I believe it came to rest right here. You can see a severed auger pile with the single rod of rebar still attached to the concrete base layer of the blast surface. I don't know if the Fondag layer was actually tied into the base using rebar, but I'm assuming there is a possibility it wasn't because when I toured the aftermath, I wasn't able to find any sections of concrete that were still attached to the Fondag. The way you can differentiate the Fondag from the concrete is by carelessly picking up one of these blocks without paying attention to the sharp steel fibers that are embedded within the aggregate mixture. These steel strands are used to enhance the Fondag and prevent micro cracks from forming within the material. Anyways, this failure set off a chain of events where a giant crater was excavated by the booster's 33 engines while the remaining three corners of the pad began to fail in succession. Had they all failed at the same time, this crater would likely be even larger. And also, had the booster remained on the pad for even a second longer, this damage may have actually ended up being unrecoverable. Now, this is a rather intense bit of speculation here, which is why I was really grateful that I had the opportunity to ask Elon about this during the April 29th Starship Twitter Space event, and here's how that went. We would erode uh, some amount of the concrete, but that it would be fine. We certainly didn't expect to effectively, what looks like, like when we went up to full thrust, probably shattered the concrete. Um, mm. So... Is it possible that the base layer failed first instead of the actual Fondag layer on top? It is. Um, 
but we, we are getting into some some amount of speculation here. Um, one of the more probable explanations is that when we went up to full thrust, that, that we may have compressed the sand underneath the concrete uh, to such a degree that the concrete uh, effectively bent and then cracked. That, that's a, that is a leading theory. So first of all, I want to thank Elon for the exceptional level of transparency and for the most part, not shying away from any of the questions that were asked. I think it's awesome that he was willing to sit down in front of a large group and just talk about what happened. It truly helped us get a better understanding of the events that took place. After hearing his response, I realized that I needed to address one of the details that he mentioned related to the compressed sand. So looking at that example that I showed a few minutes ago, you can see the main areas where you might need to worry about sand being compressed is near those four unsupported corners. This is where the concrete slab is primarily being supported by the sand underneath. So it's pretty straightforward to imagine that 100 to 150 tons of force per square meter could cause the sand to compress underneath. This, coupled with the vibrations from the acoustic energy of the 33 Raptor engines, would likely be enough to cause the sand to densify into a tighter configuration. Now, because of the way the ground was prepared prior to construction, this would actually be a relatively small volume change and shouldn't really cause too much of a loss in bearing capacity or shear strength. But, the other thing that we have to consider into this equation is the height of the water table. In the days after the pad was excavated by Booster 7, we noticed SpaceX pumping out water from inside of the massive crater. If loose soil and sand is located below the water table, they can become saturated with water, and once that happens, we now have to worry about another phenomena known as liquefaction. As explained in this animation by Seismic Solutions, because water is essentially incompressible, any densification of these soils due to a seismic event like the one that occurred prior to liftoff will result in increased pressure in the water between the pores of the individual grains. When this pore water reaches the pressure that is approaching the shear strength of the soil, then the grains will actually begin to lose contact with each other and essentially transition into a liquid state. This can quickly result in the failure of the bearing capacity within the soil and cause a collapse. So, now that we understand what caused the failure of this blast surface, let's discuss the solution that SpaceX has come up with to prevent this from occurring again. I have to be honest with you all. When I first saw the images showing the damage to the structure, I did not think it would be possible to repair this. My initial opinion, which I stated on Twitter, was that we should not expect to see another Starship launch until 2024, and that this may require SpaceX to start over from scratch. Thankfully, my initial assumption was wrong. But I wanted to acknowledge that before we jump into this next part. The first step to repairing and improving this launch structure will involve excavating all of this unusable and damaged material from out of this crater. SpaceX is already well underway with this process by now. After this, they will need to repair the lateral supports of the tension ring in these three locations. I'm not 100% certain yet on what will be required for them to pull this off, so I won't bother speculating on how that will be accomplished. We will just have to wait and see on that. In the center of the blast surface, SpaceX will need to remove all of the damaged auger pilings and replace them with new ones. This time around, we believe they will no longer be using the single strand of rebar like they did in the original design. In a recent video posted by Starship Gazer, he noticed the new circular rebar cages being assembled near the berm in between the launch mount and the orbital tank farm. This will be a significant structural upgrade from what was present in the original auger piles, and these will be far less likely to form cracks and fail under shear stress. Once this is complete, SpaceX will install a system that they began constructing back in January of this year. We have been keeping our eyes out on this for quite some time, and initially thought this was going to be some sort of water deluge system. It seems like that may actually be a secondary function, however, and is not its primary purpose. Thanks to the information that Elon has provided over the past few weeks, we now have a better understanding of how this will work. I'm not going to go too deeply into this because we are still not 100% certain what the final version will look like, but here's what we do know. This water-cooled steel blast surface will be installed in place of, well, everything that used to be under the OLM. So one way or another, the fondag and concrete base layer would have eventually been removed. And it's possible that the pre-existing auger piles would have needed to be cropped down in order to allow the new base layer of concrete to be formed several meters below its original height. I believe this will be needed in order to create a base for these steel box frame structures to be placed into the ground. We can't be 100% certain of this because we have only spotted two of them thus far. But we anticipate that these will be used to hold up the new blast surface and could theoretically be mounted on top of mass dampers that will reduce the amount of vibrations transferred to the ground. 
but that part is a stretch. So the first step will be to excavate around the hexagonal base structure so that this multi-section water manifold can be placed into the ground. This is similar to the one that was constructed for pad 39A, except at that location, it was constructed as a single manifold. They were able to get away with this because it was part of the original design, so they were able to route the piping for the propellant supply system with this in mind. At Starbase, there are two concrete culverts in the ground, which carry various cryotubing and high-pressure gas lines that supply the orbital launch mount. In the middle of those two culverts is a large amount of conduit buried in the ground that supplies power and communications to the launch mount as well. Because of these obstacles, SpaceX had to get creative with designing this manifold in a way that would allow it to fit around everything else that is already present in the ground. Once these are in place, they will add in the water-cooled steel sandwich. You can see them here in this image from RGV Aerial Photography. There are six rectangular plates and six trapezoids, which will be arranged like this under the OLM, with a smaller rectangular plate to join them together. There will also need to be six triangular pieces in the center for full coverage. Looking at these plates from the ground view, we can see that the top plate is about an inch and a half to two inches thick. There are vertical supports that create a large gap between the top and bottom plates, which is where the water will flow through. Viewing them again from above, we can see the markings on top, which look like they might be weld marks to attach the vertical plates. But after hearing Elon describe this system, I think it's possible that these are actually circular perforations in the top plate, which will later be removed. This will create the upside down shower head that Elon described. On the bottom side of the rectangular plates, there is a row of large holes where the water will be supplied from the manifolds that I mentioned a few minutes ago. There will likely be end caps where the second row of eight pipes will be connected to. By extending this out from under the legs, they will prevent damage to the concrete outside of the blast surface. Finally, the edges of the plates will be welded to the wedge-shaped flame diverters attached to the six columns that the table rests on top of. This will prevent them from being pulled towards the center under the force of the 33 Raptor engines. Think of it like a gigantic steel trampoline where the columns are the springs that provide the strength and tension. The most important part of all of this is to make sure that the water pressure exiting the nozzles is exceeding the stagnation pressure of the 33 Raptor engines. This will prevent the abrasive exhaust flow from entering the void space between the top and bottom plates of the blast surface. If that were to happen, it could theoretically cause a blowout of the entire system as steam would be rapidly generated inside of the plates and possibly the water manifold as well. With nowhere else to go other than back to the source of water, the entire manifold could explode under the right conditions. But SpaceX has already considered and designed around this possibility. In order to force water out with the required amount of pressure, they will use 76 high-pressure gas canisters, which are able to store gas at somewhere between 200 and 400 bar, which is about 3,000 to 6,000 PSI, similar to the ones that are on the roof of the fluids bunker. By maintaining a layer of water in between the exhaust plume and the blast surface, they should easily be able to prevent the top plate from melting. Even if the temperature still reaches the point where the water begins to boil on the backside of the steel plate, it should have a rather short path to escape out of the nozzles without generating too much additional pressure between the plates. We may dive deeper into the physics of this in a future episode and actually attempt to simulate the heat loading, but for now, we will just keep it conceptual. Now that we understand this system a little better, I think there is a chance that we should no longer expect to see a large water tank constructed in this area. The water contained within these tanks may be enough to do the job, as long as the rest of the four foot diameter pipe sections are already flooded. Yo, I seriously hope that I can get some kind of forewarning when this system is ready to be tested for the first time, because I really want to be there to see this in person. It's going to be pretty incredible to watch, especially if it ends up being a two-stage system, which we will discuss here in a bit. For now, let's return to the footage from the launch, starting again at T minus two seconds, because there is another important moment that we need to analyze. Booster 7 has just begun the ignition sequence and now has all 33 engines ignited. The engine grouping that we care about the most right now are the outer 20 engines, which are presumably the last to ignite. The flight computer is in the process of checking the health of all the engines and is preparing to throttle up. While this is taking place, there is another pretty major concern that has to be addressed when it came to protecting the orbital launch mount. First of all, how do we protect the 20 nozzles or quick disconnects that are used to start up the outer 20 engines? And second, how do we prevent superheated gases, shock waves from overpressure events, and airborne shrapnel from engine explosions from entering into the launch mount structure and causing serious damage? This is extremely important because if you look at the original design of the hold down arms and the Raptor Boost Quick Disconnects, or RBQDs for short, 
there are some pretty massive holes that allow for direct access to the mechanical systems on the inside of the structure. I'm not sure if this was always part of the plan, or if the July 11th detonation event was the reason that SpaceX decided that the protections we are about to discuss were super necessary. Let's start off with the hold down arms. On September 7th, 2022, SpaceX began installing these large panels onto the sides of the hold down arms. These are used to prevent hot gases and large debris from entering through the sides and damaging the hydraulic actuators that are used to extend and retract the load arms. By releasing the hold down clamps 11 minutes early, they no longer need to worry about them being damaged during engine startup. But the 20 pistons used to retract everything into the table are a completely different story. This is because if even a single one of them were to fail, that would be a very bad day for the protective shielding on the engine skirt. A few weeks after the side shielding was complete, they added these curved panels on top of the constraining links to prevent anything from entering through the top as well. I'm sure to some degree this also helps prevent rainwater from entering the structure, which is good considering how corrosive this environment is. Anyways, here is the before and after of the hold down arm shielding. You can see it does a pretty good job of closing up all these gaps. Next up are the RBQDs, which were already protected from above by the retractable hoods. They also have a small shield below the nozzles to deflect shock waves that are bouncing up from the blast surface. But this was nowhere near enough protection, because in the event of an overpressure situation, these are basically still exposed from all sides. That's a problem for all of the delicate pipes that are delivering high pressure gases to the QD nozzles. Another issue, which was perhaps even more difficult to address, was the massive hole entering the table. You can see the five circular piping manifolds visible behind them. These are used to supply high pressure helium, nitrogen, oxygen, and methane to the 20 Raptor QDs. In between the manifold and the nozzles are the flex hoses which connect them together. This is a very complex mechanism to design a protection system for, because of the way everything folds back into the table. So any new shielding here must allow for initial retraction of the RBQD nozzles after ignition and cannot interfere with the secondary retraction into the table. Before I explain how they accomplished this, I just want to say that it was incredibly difficult for us to figure out what was going on in here. If not for Agent Ryan's exceptional ability to angle match all of these images with this 3D model, we probably would not have been able to figure this out. This also required Starship Gazer to be at the launch site at the perfect time of day to capture these images. The position of the sun had to be just right in order for you to see through these openings, so shout out to Starship Gazer for all of that hard work gathering these for us. I have a link to his Patreon in the description if you would like to support one of the great Starbase photographers. So the first thing we noticed was a triangular side plate that was welded onto the retracting arm of the QD. About a week later, we realized that additional shielding had been installed around the nozzles as well. From what we were able to tell, this is a two-piece shield that now protects the nozzles from below and also from the sides. The reason it is constructed out of two separate U-shaped plates is to allow the nozzle to perform the initial retraction away from the injection port of the Raptor engines. So the first plate is attached directly to the nozzle and is moved by the QD piston, while the secondary plate remains stationary. After this was completed, we noticed additional paneling which we thought created a two-piece interior hood that would separate in two different directions when the hold down arm retraction was initiated. As cool as that idea is, Ryan realized that this was actually a backing panel which is attached to the roof and doesn't move at all. The purpose of this panel is to prevent shock waves or debris from engine explosions from damaging the high pressure gas pipes mounted to the ceiling. After everything was completed, SpaceX performed a retraction test to make sure that everything worked the way it was supposed to without any collisions. Hold down arm retraction was significantly louder after all of this heavy steel paneling was installed. After it was over, we could hear workers inside of the table cheering. Now, I can't even imagine what that must have been like to witness this from inside of the table. But thanks to Ryan, I was able to try it out for myself. All right, so I brought Lewis from the Lab Padre channel up here with me since What's he happened guys? to be in the area. Now the key here, as always, is to make sure you have your safety gear. Hey, uh, make sure you stand clear of those flex hoses because they have a tendency to snap back. Gotcha. All right, run it. Damn. Man, that was loud. Yo, this is just this is just one of the reasons why I keep trying to tell people that the orbital launch mount is an engineering masterpiece. Really, Zach? You need some tissue. No, I'm good, man. I'm good. From what we can tell, the new shielding seemed to do its job. Although we are unsure if anything inside of the launch mount was damaged, but as of right now, we haven't seen anything other than the Raptor QDs removed, so that's a really good sign. 
Okay, next item on the list is the Booster QD. Now, this one is rather simple. Just like the Raptor QDs, the goal is to prevent explosions and foreign object and debris from damaging the critical components inside of the BQD during engine startup, long duration static fires, and overpressure events. For this, they installed a deflector shield below the BQD panel, which also adds some protection from the sides. It's still completely unprotected from above as you can see, but I don't know if there is much that could be done about that because of the design of the swinging blast door that protects the BQD after it retracts. This would only be an issue if debris begins to rain down from above. The door itself is a big concern, but it seemed to hold up pretty well, and had it not, SpaceX already has another ready to go. Eventually, with repeated usage, this will inevitably have to be replaced though. I also want to briefly mention the BQD rear shielding, which is pretty straightforward as well. But it's important to note that these are one of the few shielding upgrades that aren't welded in place. These are designed to be removable in case repair work or upgrades are needed to be performed. Unfortunately, this shielding did not stop this emergency depressurization vent for the methane from being severed, so that will have to be replaced. This is probably not a very big deal though. If there ever was a pad explosion, none of this makes any difference whatsoever. But I believe all of these protective measures performed extremely well during the violent event that occurred on April 20th. It's now T plus seven seconds, and the vehicle has finally cleared the pad. The hold down clamps have retracted, and the world's largest blowtorch is now sending a massive flame straight through the inside ring of the orbital launch mount. There is now another huge issue that also has to be addressed here. The superheated exhaust coming out of the 33 Raptor engines is an extremely abrasive force that will immediately begin eroding away the inside edge of the orbital launch mount. According to a statement made by Elon Musk during this recent Twitter Spaces update, Depending on how close the engines are, they erode that steel at a roughly half an inch to an inch per second. Damn! Of high strength steel is eroded by the, the cutting the torch. <laughs> so. Yo, that is absolutely insane. And honestly, it sounds made up. We can probably assume that this is accurate because we know that SpaceX has done some testing in order to verify this. Some of you may remember this steel sandwich that was mounted in front of a Raptor engine test stand at the McGregor, Texas facility late last year. Now, NASA Spaceflight did label this as a concrete test article, which it very well could be. However, when we compare this to the future water-cooled blast surface that SpaceX is in the process of constructing, you will notice that this has the exact same color as the material that we see in this test article. So it's likely where they got this data from. I believe this was a proof of concept test for the system that we are expecting to see installed before the next test flight, even though there was no water involved here from what we can tell. Anyways, in order to prevent erosion of the inside edge of the launch mount, SpaceX began mounting what we have been referring to as burn plates in between each of the hold down arms. I actually first noticed these back in September of last year when most of the major final upgrades of the launch mount were taking place. I had a feeling it was something related to the inside edge of the ring due to the insane amount of welding that was going on in there. But it wasn't until E posted this picture on Twitter when Ryan and I were finally able to figure out what they were doing. So. What we have here are strips of steel that have been welded to the outer surface. They more than likely have tapped holes drilled through them to allow these thick burn plates to be bolted down instead of permanently attaching them. These sacrificial plates protect the interior of the launch mount by drastically reducing the amount of heat that is transferred through the walls. After an unknown number of launches, these will be worn down and replaced, but that's better than the permanent damage from erosion and warping of this surface that could likely occur otherwise. It seems that this feature did its job as planned and remained in perfect condition from what I was able to tell. T plus 12 seconds. Easily one of the most intense moments in my entire life. The feeling I had while witnessing this power slide off of the pad is something I cannot easily describe. As I said earlier, I discussed the possibility of this happening in the episode I released the week before the launch, where we learned about the load monitoring system for the hold down clamps. I did not, however, actually expect to see that occur in real life. The moment I saw the ship lean to the side, my first thought was that there is clearly multiple engines that were not performing properly, because this is the exact situation that we simulated using the Starbase Sim video game. For me, it was absolutely terrifying to be tracking this object on camera when you aren't sure if it's about to come back down to the ground. But I loved every second of it, even though it felt like an eternity waiting for it to straighten back out. I was honestly a bit relieved when it disappeared into the clouds because at that point, my hands were shaking and I wouldn't have been able to track it very well anyways after that point. 
This was originally speculated to be a pad avoidance maneuver by many. But during Elon's Twitter space discussion, in response to John Krause, he confirmed that this was in fact unintentional. <laughs> no, we're not. We, the, it was it's related to the engines out, and we, we do not normally expect to lean. It should be aspirationally going straight up. E also mentioned that these engines did not explode, but they were just simply not healthy enough for the computer to bring them up to full thrust, so they were shut down. This diagram from 3D forensics agent Chameleon Circuit shows the position of the engines that were aborted during the startup sequence. With the loss of two engines that were directly next to each other, there is now a 500 ton thrust efficiency on this side of the booster. So as a result, the vehicle pitched over in the direction of the lost engines, which forced the thrust vector control system to make a pretty significant correction. You can see the outcome of this when you look at the booster QD and the actual surface of the deck in this area. This is what happens when, as Elon put it, you pass the world's largest cutting torch over a flat surface. Now, it's a little difficult to determine exactly how much erosion occurred in this area, especially when you're looking at it from an altitude of 10,500 feet or 3.2 kilometers. The good news is that even if there was damage to the surface of this deck, it wouldn't really matter because SpaceX planned ahead for this as well. This is where the deck mounted burn plates come into play. Once again, Thanks to Ryan Hansen Space, we can visualize what I'm talking about here as we discuss this. So the first challenge to protecting this top surface was making sure that the 20 deck cameras don't get destroyed during the launch. These cameras were originally mounted onto the edge of the deck and are used to allow engineers in the control room to visually monitor the position of the booster as it's being lowered down onto the hold down clamps. This is not a system that SpaceX can allow to be destroyed during the launch because eventually they will need this to be operational when the booster returns to the launch site eight and a half minutes after liftoff. With this in mind, SpaceX could not simply attach these burn plates directly to the surface of the top deck because they need room for these shielded camera cables. So the cameras were moved from the top deck and relocated to the top left corner of the cubbies where the hold down clamps retract into. On March 14th, SpaceX workers began lifting these T-shaped plates onto the deck of the orbital launch mount. There were 18 of these in total. The purpose of these plates as described by Agent Ryan, is to be mounted on top of the inside edge of the top deck. They are placed across the corners which allow the camera cables to be routed down into the cubbies. This also creates a decent overhang from the top deck that should protect the backside of the hold down clamps from the exhaust flow to some degree, but more importantly, they protect the cameras. Well, at least as long as the booster doesn't perform a power slide over the launch mount. After this, stainless steel burn plates were added on top. We believe there is a one and three quarter inch air gap between the deck and the sacrificial plates. Sorry for using Imperial units here, but that's the units this launch mount was designed in, so don't fight me, fight SpaceX. We believe these are designed to be cut off and replaced if necessary. However, you might notice that these look very similar to the water-cooled plates that SpaceX is planning to use for the blast surface underneath the launch mount. As Ryan was modeling these, we realized that this air gap might be useful for incorporating a water-cooled system for the upper deck, but we haven't seen any sign that this would actually be the case after they were installed. Interestingly enough, after all of this exterior shielding was completed on the launch mount, I posted this tweet, letting Elon and the SpaceX team know that I was really loving the final touches to the launch mount. In response, Elon acknowledged why all of this shielding was necessary and ended his reply by mentioning that in the future, they will need to make a water-cooled steel jacket to achieve full reusability. My initial reaction to this was to replace the VPN service that we are using here in the CSI Starbase headquarters. But then I realized that we are hardwired directly into SpaceX's data network here in the high bay, so that wouldn't really prevent him from spying on us anyways. We know the current system does not currently support this as an option, but thanks to 3D forensics agent Chrome Kiwi, we can get an idea of what a system like this might look like. This design involves circulating the water through the entire upper deck, which could be one way of pulling this off. One thing that would have to be considered in this design, however, is the possibility that by circulating the water, there would be an uneven cooling effect as the water heats up along its path. There would be a risk of generating steam within the system, which would cause a blowout of the panels. One way to prevent this would be to dump the water over the inside edge of the table, possibly using the gaps that the camera cables are routed through. The third option would be perforated plates similar to what we are expecting to see on the blast surface. And when we look at these from the aerial view, it looks like these perforations are already present, but are currently capped off just like the ones on the lower blast surface. 
This would be a secondary water system that wouldn't be activated until the hold down clamps are retracted. Just for fun, let's take a look at what all of the new protective features that we just discussed look like from the new protected camera position. All right, we are finally done talking about the ground systems for now. Let's do a quick analysis of the remaining three minutes and 45 seconds of this launch. So, Booster 7 and Ship 24 have now cleared the pad, and from the start, they were missing engine number one and also engines 26 and 27. With all of the flying debris in the air, it is very well possible that Booster 7 was struck by a large chunk of concrete as it was rising out of the ground plane. As of right now, I haven't been able to find any proof that this occurred, which aligns with the recounting of events reported by Elon Musk. At T plus 27 seconds, E stated that there was a high energy event that liberated the protective shielding from engines 17, 18, 19, and 20. We can't really rely on the SpaceX layover right here, probably due to a delay in the transmission of the telemetry. So instead we will use the one created by Space Rhino, which shows the engines in their correct orientation and is more properly synced with the footage. I'll leave a link to this in the description if you would like to review it yourself. So now we can see that the high energy event that E was speaking about was actually a failure of engine 19. In my opinion, this does not look like a simple shutdown, but instead appears to be an actual explosion in the powerhead of engine 19, which then ripped off the engine shielding on 17, 18, and 20. By the way, this is the exact situation that the hold down arms and Raptor QD shielding is designed to protect against. Shortly after this, at T plus 33 seconds, engine number 18 suffers an explosive shutdown, which I believe was the final straw for the hydraulic power unit. The hydraulic power unit, or HPU for short, is located in between engines 18 and 19 on the side of the booster. The hydraulic power units are used to actuate the thrust vector control system, which you can see in this dope video from Trevor Malman. Elon did not explicitly state that the first HPU was destroyed at this point, but when we look at the SpaceX footage, you can clearly see a flame inside of the HPU starting at T plus 33 seconds. In this angle filmed by Ricardo G in Matamorros, Mexico, we can see that a massive fireball is ejected out of the back of Booster 7 at the same time this high energy event takes place. I believe that the HPU explosion caused a catastrophic rupture in the hydraulic lines somewhere inside of the engine skirt, which resulted in the remaining fluid from the reservoir to be emptied into the exhaust plane. This must have been a pretty large amount of hydraulic fluid, because after this point, there was a fire raging inside of the engine skirt for the remainder of the flight, which we could see very clearly thanks to the tracking footage from Cosmic Perspective and the Everyday Astronaut. If this hydraulic power unit was taken out of commission, then that would have caused the second HPU to have to put the team on its back and would put additional load on that unit. This does not, however, mean a total loss of control, nor does it affect stage separation. After this, the next major event occurred somewhere around T plus 55 seconds, and this is when we noticed what appeared to be a major leak of liquid oxygen coming from an unknown location. You could see the sudden drop in liquid oxygen levels in the telemetry provided by SpaceX during the live stream coverage. Here is also a graphical representation of it, posted by Marcel12645297 on Twitter. Looking at the EDA footage, we can see a trail of liquid or gas bleeding into the exhaust plume. This trail becomes extremely bright as it begins to reflect the light from the booster's 27 functional engines. Initially, I considered that this could be an intentional LOX dump in order to increase the thrust to weight ratio to compensate for the loss of additional engines. There are two valves on the bottom of the booster in these two positions which can be used for dumping locks from the tank. The fluid did not seem to be coming from this position though, so we cannot say for sure that this is what happened. Unfortunately, during Elon's Twitter space, none of us who were present remembered to ask about this detail, so all we can do right now is speculate on what happened here. After this, at T plus 62 seconds, we witnessed another engine get murdered, and this time it's engine number 22. This is accompanied by more engine shielding being ejected from the vehicle at T plus 65 seconds. This is now the sixth engine to fail. At T plus 85 seconds, Elon stated that engine number six lost communication to thrust vector control. This wasn't just an isolated failure. It seems to have affected all remaining center gimbling engines, which means that for the next 155 seconds, the booster now essentially had zero capability of maintaining the desired flight path. At T plus 94 seconds, engine number two shuts down, followed by engine number 23, six seconds later. Booster 7 is now running on 25 of 33 engines. 
With the crazy imbalance of thrust on the outer ring of 20 engines, the vehicle begins to perform cartwheels through the atmosphere, and I'm not gonna lie, this was pretty hilarious to watch. If you would have asked me if these two vehicles would be able to withstand this type of maneuver two weeks ago, I probably would have said absolutely not. But this is why I usually stick to analyzing ground support systems. Anyways, after this, the vehicle continued its uncontrolled tumble for quite some time. A lot of folks were wondering why the flight termination system wasn't triggered earlier, myself included. However, I'm sure both SpaceX and the FAA were likely monitoring the vehicle's trajectory very closely at this time. As long as the vehicle wasn't in danger of ending up somewhere outside of the exclusion zone, then there wasn't really any reason to not let it proceed. I'm sure SpaceX gained massive amounts of data during this period. All I have to say is that I am extremely impressed with the way this vehicle performed under the circumstances, and I don't really see anything wrong with what occurred here. At least until we reach the point where the FTS was actually manually commanded from the ground. According to Elon Musk, it took roughly 40 seconds for the vehicle to be destroyed after activation of the flight termination system. Shout out to Scott Manley for figuring this one out long before anyone else. Personally, I didn't think there was any chance that he was right about this at first, but looking at this stabilized footage from Tim Dodd, we can see the moment that the FTS on both the ship and the booster were triggered. Surprisingly, this did not result in the immediate destruction of the vehicle. For the life of me, I can't understand how puncturing the LOX and methane propellant tanks on both vehicles didn't immediately destroy them. Instead, it appears that the booster actually suffered a massive explosion within the engine bay, which then took out the rest of the liquid oxygen tank, and then finally the methane tank as well. About a second and a half later, we saw the explosion of the Starship second stage. There was an interesting moment before the explosion of Ship 24, which had a lot of us speculating whether or not the second stage engines were actually ignited. Tim Dodd and I were both pretty convinced that this actually did occur, because once you slow down the footage at the moment before the explosion, you can see three blue lights inside of the plume, which look an awful lot like what we would expect to see if the three Vacuum Raptor engines were ignited. The ship then made an aggressive turn to the side for a brief moment before the final explosion occurs at T plus 241 seconds. We both tried our hardest to press Elon on this issue during the Twitter space, but this is what he said. Um, and by the way, you know, people have like basically think that maybe something different from this occurred that would be interesting to, because I, I know pe some people have looked very closely frame by frame at, at video, but this is the SpaceX best assessment after a week. Um, um, yeah, I can confirm that we have been doing a massive amount of speculation, in particular as it relates to stage separation. So I guess this is a two part question. Number one, um, what actually triggers second stage ignition? And number two, did Ship 24 attempt to ignite its engines after Booster 7 was destroyed? Uh, no, it, it did not. It, it, when um, flight termination is, is uh, executed, it, it, it's executed on both. Come so on, the, ship, the ship currently does not attempt to save itself. Um, arguably, maybe it should. Come on, Tim, press a point. Um, yeah, it's crazy. It looks like the engine's lit after the booster let go and after the booster finally blew up like there's what looks like engine ignition pretty wild deny that uh that is that has not been reported to me in the data reviews that uh it's, it's not impossible but it's not been reported to me that that is certainly not what the ship should be doing after a termination event so what i actually got from that is that it's not confirmed yet but he didn't explicitly say no so maybe there's still a chance that this actually did happen Hopefully one day SpaceX will release more info on this, but I'm not gonna get my hopes up. At the end of the exchange, Elon mentioned that it might actually be a good idea for the ship to separate and attempt to continue the mission once it becomes apparent that the booster is not going to survive. This of course would only be a good idea if the second stage actually has a chance of reaching orbit at the moment this decision needs to be made. Overall, this was an incredible first integrated test flight for Starship, and I wanna once again congratulate the SpaceX team for everything they have accomplished up to this point. The only direction they can go from here is up, literally. From what we have seen in the days since the launch, SpaceX has quickly gotten to work with repairs to the orbital launch mount, so maybe Elon's two month timeline isn't all that unrealistic. I will personally tack on another two months to that estimate, but either way, it's still better than my initial fears of more than a year of reconstruction before the next launch attempt. I'm more than happy to be wrong about that. One of the most difficult challenges that they will have coming up is the recertification of the FTS system. It seems that everyone is in agreement that the way those final moments went down is highly undesirable. 
Elon mentioned that the new version of the flight termination system will likely resemble a strip of detonation cord. I imagine this may be placed vertically across the common dome of both the booster and the ship so that it completely unzips both tanks instead of simply punching a hole in them. This is actually a pretty interesting idea to consider, but hopefully we never have to see that in action. All right, before we get out of here, there is one final important thing to discuss, and that is the orbital tank farm. During the initial Twitter space interview that took place on April 16th, I had the chance to ask E a question that I've been dying to know the answer to for a long time. Hi, Elon. Yeah, so I was just wondering, what would you say was one of the largest, um, you know, hurdles that you had to cross in order to get this launch underway? Um, because obviously there was tons of like GSE issues, tons of actual vehicle issues, structural qualification testing. So out of all the things that you came up against leading up to this big day, what was the most difficult challenge that you had to get over in order to reach this milestone? I mean, I guess in retrospect, we should have gone with relatively off the shelf, vacuum jacketed, horizontal sure. tank Thanks. or propellant yeah. instead of trying to make our own. You know, we call them like the hot dogs, the, the, the big horizontal vacuum jacketed tanks. Right. So probably should have gotten gone with those instead of trying to build our own. So the moment Elon answered this, I began thinking about these horizontal storage tanks and how they have been sitting unused at the Massey site for several months now. Ever since their arrival, I had a feeling that these would end up being used for the tank farm expansion at the launch complex because there is really no other destination for them that makes sense. After seeing the results of this first integrated flight test, I think it became even more apparent that placing these massive vertical tanks this close to the launch mount was a very, very bad idea. Don't get me wrong, it is extremely well designed, and it's just about as efficient of a tank farm setup that you could possibly create. But yeah, damage like this should not even be allowed to be possible. Thankfully, on April 29th, Elon mentioned that these tanks will likely be replaced with horizontal storage tanks. I do not expect to see this happen until after the second orbital test flight, however, because replacing these tanks presents several issues. The biggest problem here is that in order to store the amount of liquid oxygen and liquid nitrogen required for launch operations inside of horizontal tanks, they are going to need close to two and a half times the number of tanks that we currently see in the methane tank farm. The bullet tanks used for storing liquid oxygen will more than likely be larger than the ones we are seeing here. At minimum, they will at least be the same size as the two largest methane tanks here. As you can imagine, this will simply not fit inside of the existing tank farm footprint. That means it will need to be relocated somewhere else. It's going to require a massive amount of surface area to pull this off. Overall, the best solution, I think, would be to construct one giant tank like the one we see at Pad 39A and place it in this location behind the tower. And to those of you who have been watching this channel for a while, yes, I am finally acknowledging that this is a liquid oxygen tank and not water. I needed to prove that one for myself instead of accepting people's word for it. That's just how I roll. Anyways, the existing tank farm area can be replaced with smaller horizontal tanks used to store liquid nitrogen, and the locks can be moved behind the tower. I think this will also require a new fluids bunker to be constructed, along with physically moving the locks pumps to a completely different location close to the tower. The only problem with this idea is its proximity to the suborbital test stands, so we will see what ends up happening. Beyond that, I have a feeling this will require additional approval from the Army Corps of Engineers. Either way, that is not going to be an easy job. But I trust that the incredible team at SpaceX has already come up with a solution. We will let you know as soon as we figure out what that is. Anyways, I hope I was successful in answering a lot of the remaining questions that you may have had after the first Starship integrated flight test. If you enjoyed this episode, then do us a favor and hit that like button. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. As you can hopefully tell, we put a tremendous amount of time and effort into these episodes, and maintaining this level of production quality is certainly not cheap. If you would like to contribute to the future growth of this channel and help us towards our goal of being able to increase the frequency of these episodes, you can do so by becoming a member of the YouTube channel or a monthly supporter on Patreon. As a perk, you will be able to watch the ad-free version of these episodes, and you can also gain access to the CSI Starbase Discord server where you can hang out with me and the rest of the CSI team. I want to say a huge thank you to those of you who have supported us so far, and a shout out to those of you who donated to the camera fund, which allowed me to be able to capture that incredible footage of the historical first integrated flight test of Starship. As always, I also want to thank all of the photographers and 3D artists whose content was used in today's investigation, especially Ryan Hansen Space, who spent the last seven months working with me to create all of the incredible animations that were used in this investigative report. Before we go, 
I want to also thank my team of CSI field agents who helped gather all the information needed to explain this story to you today because there was a ridiculous amount of research time that went into this one. Last but not least, thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring today's Deep Dive Investigation. All right, that's my time for today. I hope to see you all in the next Deep Dive Investigation. For now, this is Stage Zero Zach, signing off.